about to hear something uh, from one of the top scholars in God's kingdom today. He loves the Lord. He loves his word. He loves the church. And it's an honor to give to you uh, Professor Richard Bauckham. Thank you very much for your welcome. It's uh, very nice to be here with you this evening. I'm delighted to be here. If you want a clue to what this whole lecture is about, you can read the title, but you could also learn that the, the key to the lecture is in just one little word, the word one. And it's the word one in the Gospel of John that I'm going to talk about. And this word one, of course, it occurs many times in the Gospel of John, as it does in the whole of the New Testament and throughout Greek literature. But in just a limited number of texts in John, 12 occurrences of the word one in eight texts of John, and if you have the handout in front of you, I've listed them there, it's under the second heading on the first page. Those are the eight texts that I'm going to say something about. Um, and there were 12 uses of the word one within those texts. This little word one in those texts, I think, becomes a theologically very potent term. Well worth thinking about. But just a few words first about the meaning of the word one, which you may think is a bit thoroughly obvious, but it's not as simple as you might think. You might think initially that one is just a straightforward word. It's just the first of the cardinal numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on. If any of you have learned a language, you will probably have learned the sequence of numbers in that language, one, two, three, four, five. And that gives us the impression that that's all that the word one is. It's just one of that sequence of cardinal numbers. But in fact, in Hebrew and in Greek and in English, and don't worry about the languages because what I can say about the word one in Greek and in Hebrew is also true in English, so you'll understand very easily uh, what I need to say. The word one actually is used in a far wider variety of ways and a far wide, with a far wider significance than two or three or four or any of the other ordinary numerals. Actually, one is much more than just a number. Now, I want to just focus your attention on two different kinds of significance that statements that persons or things are one can have. In the first case, it can signify uniqueness or singularity, that there is only one of a person or thing in question. In English, perhaps we tend to say only one when that's what we mean, but not always. I could say there is one person I wish to speak to and means there's just one person I'm looking out for that I wish to speak to. So that's the sense of one in the sense of unique, the only one. On the other hand, however, the word one can signify unity, being united, unified. So whereas in the first case, uniqueness, we're thinking of one of something or other contrasted with many of those things, in this case, we're thinking of unity as opposed to division. A group of people can be united, and in English we can sometimes say of such a group that they are one, or maybe as one. Though I guess we would more often use the word 
united. But in Greek and Hebrew, it's very normal to use the word one in that sense of united. So we need to bear in mind as we look at the theologically significant uses of this little word one in the Gospel of John, that it can have these two different dimensions of meaning. It can point to the uniqueness of a single person or thing. Um, There is only one of them. Or it can point to the unity of a group of persons or things. The group is united rather than divided. Now, let's look at some background, what I call early Jewish background. In other words, uh, what people thought in, uh, among Jewish people at the time of Jesus. This very ordinary little word one was a hugely potent word theologically for the Jews of that period because of its occurrence in what is known as the Shema. The Shema was the nearest thing to a Jewish creed. It was recited by every good observant Jew every morning. And so probably more familiar than any other scriptural text. And it is a scriptural text. It's the passage in Deuteronomy that begins, and this will be familiar to most of you. You may not know it was called the Shema, but this is it. It, It's the passage that begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Now, the grammar of the first part of that, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, can be read a number of different ways, possibly, and some modern translations translate it a little bit differently. It's why I mention it. But there's very good evidence that at least the usual way in which Jews of the time of Jesus and the New Testament read that phrase was, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so any passage in Jewish literature that says that God is one or that there is one God, meaning only one God, is an echo of the Shema. And there are many such echoes in the literature, in the Jewish literature of this period, because this was the central distinctive of Jewish faith in the religiously pluralistic world of the early Roman Empire. Jews were exceptional and widely known to be exceptional because they acknowledged and worshipped only one God. And notice from the quotation from Deuteronomy as I read it, the one God was not just an article of faith. It wasn't just believing that there is only one God. According to the Shema, God's people are to love him with their whole being, worshipping this one God alone, practicing their devotion to him through obedience to God's law, the Torah. Now, of our two dimensions of the meaning of one, this usage is very clearly a case of uniqueness. There is only one God, not many. In Jewish literature, I don't think there is ever any implication of the other sort of meaning, God is unified rather than divided. As far as I can see, Jewish writers were just not concerned with that question. It didn't occur to them. It was of concern to Greek philosophers and later to the Christian fathers of the church in the early centuries. The idea that divine nature, by contrast with creatures, is indivisible, non-composite, as opposed to creaturely being, which is divisible, uh, and therefore not unified, um, something like that. But that sort of thinking about God was not around in the Judaism of the New Testament times. God is one means God is unique. There is only one of him. But then, secondly, we need to consider the use of this word one in Jewish literature with reference to God's people Israel. There are a series of passages in the Old Testament prophets that are key texts 
for understanding the use of the word one in uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, you have these on the handouts on the second page, passages from Ezekiel, Micah, Hosea, Isaiah. I haven't printed them all out, but the most important ones are there. Now, remember a little bit of Old Testament history. Um, following the glorious days of Solomon, when the people of Israel were united uh, in one kingdom, you remember that Israel was tragically divided into the two kingdoms of Israel and Judah, the northern tribes and the southern tribes. People from both of those kingdoms were taken into exile, first northern Israel by the Assyrians, then the people of Judah in the south by the Babylonians. And the result of that history was that the great hope for the future of God's people that we find in the prophets of that period includes the hope that God is going to regather his people whom he has scattered among the nations, returning them to the land of Israel. And this is a reuniting of God's people both in the general sense that Israelites from all over the world will be regathered together in the Holy Land, but also more specifically in the sense that the northern tribes and the southern tribes, the divided kingdom, as it were, will be reunited as of old under David in a single people under the rule of the new David, the Messiah, who will rule God's one people on behalf of their one God. Um, we'll just read through the longest of those texts so that you can see what's going on in this thinking. The, the text from Ezekiel 37, and this is God addressing the prophet Ezekiel. And uh, it's one of these kind of prophetic signs that you get quite frequently in the prophets where God um, tells the prophet to do something um, rather, rather, rather puzzling perhaps, something to draw attention, a symbolic act. And the people ask, what's this all about? And then they can explain the message. So God says to Ezekiel, mortal, take a stick and write on it for Judah and the Israelites associated with it. So that's the southern tribes. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel associated with it. So that's the northern tribes. And join them together into one stick so that they may become one in your hand. And when the people say to you, will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am about to take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel associated with it, and I will put the stick of Judah upon it and make them one stick, in order that they may be one in my hand. When the sticks on which you write in your hand are in your hand before their eyes, then say to them, thus says the Lord God, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, will gather them into every quarter and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. Never again shall they be two nations, never again shall they be divided into two kingdoms. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. So I'm sure you've picked up there the constant recurrence of this key word one, used in actually several different ways uh, in that passage. So Returning to our um, two dimensions of meaning of the word one, what's happening there in these passages? The meaning when the prophets speak of Israel in the future becoming one, clearly that's unitedness, the overcoming of division overcoming of separation, in reuniting all the people of Israel into a unified people once again. Although Israel, as the people of God, 
is, in fact, unique. It's God's one and only special people. But these texts are focusing not on Israel as unique, but on Israel as united. Notice, though, what happens when the prophets connect that unity of the people with the idea that they will have one king, the restoration of the monarchy of David and Solomon. Ezekiel says they will have one king or one shepherd, which is a metaphor for king, um, as often in the Old Testament. Here the thought is of uniqueness. They will have one king, not many. So here what we have is a very interesting and intelligible connection between a unified people and their unique ruler. They are unified by the leadership of a single king. The two dimensions of meaning come, two dimensions of the meaning of oneness come together. One of them characterizing the people, the other their leader. It's a very natural connection. It's not difficult to think of many examples uh, in ordinary life of a singular something uniting a group of people. Fans of Elton John are united by their adulation of one man. They are a united group. He is a unique individual. You need one focus to unify a group of people. Now, those are the Old Testament prophets, prophecies that you'll see lie in the background to the passages in John's Gospel we're going to look at. Um, but before we do so, also very interesting are some passages from first century Jewish literature, Jewish literature from the time of Jesus and the, and the New Testament, um, which I've listed there at the, in the second half of, your, of the second sheet of the handout, second side of the handout. Um, there, there are quite a lot of these passages that are quite similar. I picked out the most interesting ones. Now, what we get in these passages is a connection between Jewish faith in the one and only God and the uniqueness of his people. He has only one special people. And the uniqueness, therefore, of his temple, only one temple in Jerusalem, and of his law, the Torah, given to his one people. So Josephus, for example, the Jewish writer of the late first century, um, is trying to answer the question, why don't the Jews have lots of temples? Why only this one temple in Jerusalem? Which again was something uh, rather remarkable um, in the view of non-Jews of the period who had lots and lots of temples. Why did the Jews have only one temple? Josephus says it's because the one God should be worshipped in one temple where his one people worship him. Now, that may at first sight not seem very logical. Why shouldn't the one God be worshipped in many temples? But this correlation of one God, one temple, one law, in some of the other passages, one people, makes much more sense when we realize that what's going on in these passages is the idea that God's people are unified by their allegiance to the one God. It's like the fans of Elton John. God's people compose one people because they're united in their devotion to the one God whose one law they obey and in whose one temple they gather to worship him. The same thought occurs in these passages I've given you from Philo, great first century Jewish philosopher theologian. But there's something uh, further that Philo makes of this, this thought, a further development of it, which is particularly relevant to the Gospel of John. Devotion to the one God unites the one people of God, he says, in a bond of love for each other. So not only does God's law command them all to love one another, 
But also, Philo is saying, their belief in the one God, as it were, inspires in them a love that unites them with each other. Um, just look at that third passage I've given you from Philo. Um, the, th- the highest and greatest source of this unanimity of the Jewish people is their creed of a single God through which, as from a fountain, they feel a love for each other, uniting them in an indissoluble bond. So there's a further interesting development of this idea of oneness, a single focus, uniting a people. I just put that passage from Ephesians in the New Testament at the end there, because now you can see, or if you read more carefully those Jewish passages, you'll see that it's a kind of Christian variation on that sort of Jewish uh, language. In other words, it lines up the one God, the one Lord, the one people, and various other things um, in the center of Christian faith that are also, as it were, unique and and unifying. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. But it's time to turn to the Gospel of John. So let's focus first of all This section is called The Reuniting of God's People. Let's focus first of all on the occurrences, uh, sorry, on the references to the oneness of the people of God in John's Gospel. John uses this word one to refer to God's people six times. Uh, That's in 1016, in 1152 and then four times in chapter 17, in uh, Jesus' great prayer in chapter 17. Now, we have here some very clear echoes of the passages that I pointed you to in the prophets. And the same sense that we found in the prophets, um, not of the uniqueness of the people of God, but of the unity In every case, it's a matter of becoming one. The people of God need to be gathered and united together. And Jesus, in chapter 17, prays very prominently among the topics of Jesus' great prayer in chapter 17. Jesus prays that they may become one. His disciples may become one. Climaxing in the final goal that they should become completely one. 1723. So it's the same sort of idea as in the prophets, but actually connecting these texts with the hope of the prophets, um, we can see, first of all, in chapter 10. Um, Chapter 10, you may remember, has this great parabolic discourse of Jesus about the Good Shepherd and his sheep, and the sheep fold. Ezekiel is undoubtedly in the background to this passage, to to the whole discourse about the the shepherd, the allusions to Ezekiel 36, 37. The climax of the parable, the parabolic narrative, the climax comes when Jesus declares himself to be the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And then he goes on. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. It's 1016. So here we have apparently, as in Ezekiel, Two divided parts of the people of God who are going to be brought together to form a united people, the one flock, united by their single shepherd, the Messiah. The unitedness of the people is related to the uniqueness of their leader. Now, 
that general thought is the most important point for what I'm trying to show you tonight. There's a more puzzling issue, which is quite debatable, about who actually are this fold and the other sheep. Who does Jesus mean? What, what are these two parts of the people of God that are going to be brought together? Now, in Ezekiel, as we saw, it's the two divisions of divided Israel, the northern and the southern tribes, that are to be united. Now, in the Gospel of John, this has certainly been transmuted in some way. And I think most likely, the idea is, on the one hand, Jewish believers in Jesus, this fold, and on the other hand, Gentile believers, the other sheep. So Jesus talks about this fold, the Jewish believers, he already has a group of them among his disciples, and later they're going to be united with other believers among the Gentiles to form the one people of God. I think that's most likely. There are other possibilities in the commentaries. Now, in this particular context, it seems that the people of God are to be united, unified by their allegiance to the one shepherd, and also actually by the fact that the shepherd lays down his life for the flock. And that thought connects this passage in chapter 10 with the other key echo of the Old Testament prophets among these texts from the gospel, which is chapter 11, verse 52. Now, just to give you the context of this, to remind you, this comes just after the story of Jesus bringing back Lazarus to life after death. And if you remember, that miracle makes Jesus so popular the Jewish authorities um, meet to decide what they can do about the threat posed by Jesus. And the high priest Caiaphas persuades them that Jesus must die by means of this argument. He says, it's better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. Now, in Caiaphas's intention... That's a straightforward political calculation. Better to put this one man to death than have the Romans come and destroy everything, as they might if he's successful. But it's also an instance of the kind of irony by which characters in John's Gospel often say more than they think they're saying. John tells us that Caiaphas quote, prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation. And he means, of course, in a, in a theological sense, the atonement. He's about to die for the nation, but not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. Not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. Now, again, the Old Testament background in the prophets is very obvious. And actually, John makes it particularly obvious because he could have just said to gather the dispersed children of God would have meant what he's saying. But actually, he says to gather into one the dispersed children of God. And that's kind of literal echo of the Hebrew in the prophets. It's redundant in Greek, really, but that's what he says, to gather into one in order to make clear the echo of the Hebrew of the Old Testament prophets. And because he wanted, therefore, to stress the word one, if he just said, gathered the dispersed people of God, he's not using the word one. He's keen to use the word one, partly because he link, it links this passage to the other texts that we're looking at that refer to the unity of the people of God. Now, that language in 1152 is a direct echo of the prophets, and the same question arises as in 1016. In other words, how does John mean us to understand the identity of the people of God here? 
not for the nation only, but to gather the dispersed children of God. Who are these two sort of parts of uh, the to be unified people? Who are the one nation and the dispersed children of God? Are we to think of Israel in the land of Israel, the nation, and Israel in exile, the dispersed children of God? It's the obvious meaning in the Jewish context. But I think, again, John must be transmuting this language, especially as in John's Gospel it's very clear that a child of God is what one must become by spiritual birth from above, not something that belongs to Jews simply by their ancestry, by their descent from Abraham. So I think the most likely meaning is not for the Jews only, but also for the Gentiles. So the people of God whom Jesus is to gather, once again, is going to bring together Jewish believers and Gentile believers. So these passages connect the sort of uniqueness of Jesus the singularity of Jesus, the one shepherd, the one man who dies for the people, with the uniting of the people of God. But now if we move into chapter 17, we find in this cluster of uses of the word one in Jesus' prayer, we find actually a much more remarkable thought, which we cannot find back there in the prophets more than just an echo of the prophets. In chapter 17, Jesus prays that his disciples may be one as we are one. In other words, as Jesus and his Father are one. He says that twice in verses 11 and 22. Now, to understand what's going on here, we have to move from the unity of the people of God to think about the unity of God himself. And then we shall come back to the people of God. So the next section is called the unity of God. Now, we can begin from the assumption I mentioned early on that in the context of first century Jewish culture and life, any use of the word one in connection with God is going to call to mind the Shema, that the Lord your God is one. The most straightforward case of this in John's Gospel is in 841, because this is something the Jewish authorities, the Jewish leaders say in dispute with Jesus, they claim to be the children of God, and they say, we have one Father, God. And they're echoing the usual Jewish creed. They're referring to God's uniqueness. The only God there is, is their Father. They are his children. It's a straightforward use of the Shema. But when we move to the other texts in which oneness is related to God, we find something quite remarkable that has no precedent in the Old Testament or in previous Jewish usage. In chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. It must be an allusion to the Shema. The word one there could not fail to recall the Shema for any Jewish hearer or reader. But as well as the uniqueness of the one God, there's one God rather than many gods, the usual significance of the Shema. We also have here that other dimension of oneness language, unity, being at one with one another. The Father and the Son are one in their communion with each other. So Jesus is claiming something revolutionary and remarkable. He's saying that this unique deity of the God of Israel consists in the communion 
between the Father and the Son. To assert that sort of oneness, the oneness of personal communion between two persons, to assert that of God is unprecedented in early Judaism. It's not that early Jewish writers said anything at all that necessarily excluded it, but it simply didn't occur to them to think of the oneness of God in that sort of way. However, this remarkable adaptation of the Shema, because that's what it is, adaptation of the Shema to include both Jesus and his Father in the unique deity of God. That adaptation of the Shema does have an interesting parallel elsewhere in the New Testament, because Paul does something rather similar, though not quite the same, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. What Paul does is to take the words of the Shema. Remember, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. He takes those words and he divides them between God the Father and Jesus. He says, for us there is one God the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So that's an interpretation of the Shema. It's virtually a Christian version of the Shema. And I actually wonder, I don't think we have any evidence to know this, but whether early Christians in Paul's churches actually recited the Shema the way Jews did, but in this Christianized version, maybe. But it clearly is a, a kind of adaptation of the Shema that includes Jesus within the definition of the one God. The one God and the one Lord, the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, compose the one God of the Shema. So that's a somewhat different way of adapting the Shema, but to the same effect, with the same kind of result as we find in Jesus' words in John 10.30. Uh, now what happens in the Gospel narrative is that Jesus makes this extraordinary claim and the Jewish leaders take up stones to stone him for blasphemy because, as they explain, they consider him guilty of blasphemy in that you, a human being, are making yourself God. And Jesus defends himself against this charge of, as it were, exalting himself to compete with God he defends himself, and the climax of his defense is another claim, equally audacious, that again persuades the Jewish leaders that he is blaspheming. In 1038, he says, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. So we've got these two remarkable claims. The Father and I are one. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And I think we should take the second of those as a kind of further explanation of the first one. How is it that the Father and the Son can be one because the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father? And that in one another language, as I call it, because it occurs elsewhere later on in John's Gospel, as you'll see, in one another language, Father in me and I in the Father, refers to this uniquely intimate communion that unites the Father and the Son. And it's clear that this is, it's not just as some, some commentators say, uh, you know, the Father and the Son are going about the same kind of thing, the Son is the agent of his Father, the Son is doing the Father's will, they're united in will, Together with that illusion to the Shema, something much more is being said there, a kind of relational intimacy between Jesus and his Father within the identity of the one and only God. Well, armed with that understanding of the unity of Jesus with his Father, 
Let's go back to the prayer of Jesus in chapter 17, where he asks that believers may be one as he and the Father are one. May they be one as you and I are one, he says to the Father. Now, that prayer is important enough to occur four times in 1711, 21, 22, 23. And the last time it occurs, it's kind of, uh, it, it, uh, it, it sort of it takes a kind of climatic form because it says that they may be perfectly one, sort of climax, that they may be one, that they may be one, that they may be perfectly one. A, lit a, law, a more literal translation of that, actually, would be that they may be perfected into one. It's rather like that expression, gathered into one, perfected into one, becoming one, brought together into one, united. So the unity of believers is a kind of process, a dynamic process of becoming one, and it will only be complete in the final fulfillment of God's purpose at the end. But how exactly does the unity of Jesus and his Father correspond to the unity of believers? What's the connection that they may be one as we may be one? Clearly there's some kind of analogy between this intimate personal communion of Jesus and his Father on the one hand, and the uni unity of believers, the unifying of believers into one people on the other. Now, that does not, we have to be very careful here, I think, to make it clear, that does not mean that there's a kind of complete correspondence. One could never say that the unity of Christian believers is exactly the same kind of thing as the unity of Jesus and his Father. Um, we don't have to equate the two, but there is a resemblance, sufficient resemblance um, for Jesus to pray that prayer, that they may be one as we are one. Now, if we ask how does it come about that that oneness of believers resembles the oneness of the Father and the Son, we have to come back to this in one another language. The prayer in chapter 17 associates the prayer for unity very closely with this being in one another. Very distinctive language, actually, of John's Gospel. You don't find it anywhere else, but it's a language of remarkably close personal communion. Persons who are so close that they can be said to as it were, occupy the same space, they're in one another. What Jesus says is that just as the Father is in him, and he is in the Father, so may they, his disciples, be in us. And again he prays that they may be one as we are one, I in them, and you in me. And then right towards the end of the prayer, he says, he prays that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. It's quite difficult language to get a hold of. And what I think one has to do is, is get, as it were, the general kind of impression of it, which is built up by these kind of different statements about being in an being in one another in different ways, Jesus in the disciples, Jesus in the Father, and, and so on. The general sense, I think, is this, that from the loving communion between the Father and the Son flows the love with which Jesus loved his disciples, and that's a love that enables them to enjoy an intimate communion with Jesus and his Father, an in one another relationship with Jesus and his Father, and then from that overflowing of divine love into the world, the oneness of believers among themselves also results. So we start with the love between the Father and the Son, 
that has existed eternally in the Trinity. That love impels Jesus to enact that love in the world, to bring that love into human life, to enable his disciples to have a in one another relationship with him and with the Father, and then finally to enable the disciples to unite among themselves with a kind of overflow of this divine love. I have too much to say, and so um, it, just, just in case you're actually following the outline of the lecture, I'm missing out the section called The Social Trinity. And I'll come to the final section, which is called From Divine Community to the World. In the bit I missed out, I was going to take you into a lot of contemporary th theologians thinking about the Trinity. But let's, since we have limited time, stick to the Gospel of John itself. And I think there's, there's still more to be said about John 17, about this language of oneness in John 17, and what it means for the Gospel of John's whole understanding of salvation, of the church, of the mission of the church. I mentioned before, and I think this is actually a vital notion, that the whole theology of the Gospel, everything else that the Gospel wants to say about what Jesus does, who Jesus is, what he does, what happens to the disciples, what, how he creates the church, the church's mission to the world, all these things flow out of the love between Jesus and his Father, which is the eternal love of the Father and the Son within the Trinity. This love between the Father and the Son is the source of the Son's mission. The goal of the Son's mission in the world is as the very last words of the prayer in chapter 17 express it, that the love with which you have loved me, the love with which your Father has loved Jesus, may be in them and I in them. So believers are to be included in the love of the Father and the Son through this in one another relationship of God and believers. And surely that's the heart of this gospel's understanding of salvation. In the end, you can say all kinds of other things about deliverance from sin and forgiveness and so on. But the heart of salvation, according to the Gospel of John, is the inclusion of believers in the love between the Father and the Son, the overflowing of the love of the Father and the Son to include human beings within it, within that circle of divine love. And that surely, too, is the key to the ecclesiology or the understanding of the church in the Gospel of John. God, well, the, 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 the central thing that the Gospel of John says about the community of the disciples and therefore looking forward to the church after the resurrection is the oneness of believers, their being united in the love of the Father and the Son as it takes effect in human relationships. And then there's a further stage. Twice Jesus prays in chapter 17 that believers may be one so that the world may believe. So it doesn't stop with the circle of Jesus' disciples as they are. They are to be one, united in love, so that the world may believe. And that's actually the, 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 the goal of all this oneness language in chapter 17. The furthest point that it reaches, as it were, is this. So that they may be one, as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. So the loving community of believers witnesses to the love of God in Christ for all the world to see. Now, this may well remind you of an earlier passage in John in the Last Supper Discourses, chapter 13, 
where Jesus talks about the new commandment that he gives to the disciples. You may remember he says, I give you a new commandment that you, loved one, that, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Now, the first thing to say about this is that what is new about this commandment is not love one another. That's in Leviticus, and elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus quotes it from Leviticus. What's new about the new commandment is that the disciples are to love one another as Jesus has loved them. So it's Jesus' love for them that makes a difference, that creates the newness of the kind of love that the disciples are now to have. And that love of one another, the gospel never says that Christians are in one another. Jesus and the Father are in one another. We are, we are in Jesus. We are in the Father. Jesus and the Father are in us. Never actually says we are in one another. So we don't quite have that fullness, that extreme intimacy of relationship, which is possible within the Trinity, it's possible between God and us, it's not possible between, between human persons. But the nearest we get to it is loving one another. The loving one another is what corresponds in human society to the love of God, the love of the Father and the Son. So when Jesus says that you're to love one another so that the world may believe, he doesn't just mean, you know, people will see that you're obeying my commandments and, and, and so they'll see that you're my people, something like that. It means much more. The world will recognize God's love at work and reflected in the Christian community. And that's the most important thing the Gospel of John says about the mission of the church in the world. It's sometimes held against this Gospel that the disciples are not commanded to love other people. They're commanded to love one another. They're not, in the Gospel of John, commanded to love their enemies or commanded even to love other people beyond the circle of believers. But what the Gospel is absolutely clear about is that God loves the world. Famous 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, if we read from 3.16, which is, as it were, the key to the mission of Jesus, it's because of God's love for the world that Jesus comes to bring God's love to the world. By the end of chapter 17, we know that this love of God for the world comprises the whole movement of God's love that begins in the mutual communion of the Father and the Son in eternity. It entails the Son's mission to include humans within that divine love. It creates the loving community of disciples of Jesus, and thereby it reaches the world. So while disciples are not in this gospel explicitly told to love the world, they certainly are caught up in that movement of God's love that has nothing less than the world as its goal. Thank you.